Christian Dolls. It is Motivation Monday, November 11th, and welcome to an all new episode of Style by Stevie. Now, how are you guys doing? Um, deep breaths. I hope you guys all are doing as excellent as I am. Um, it's been a very stressful, mentally draining time for each and every one of us. I know we've had a lot going on these past few days and weeks, but the next four years is going to be rough for us. Our lives are going to change for forever, unfortunately. Um, I'm hanging in there. I'm losing it, but I'm hanging in there. And I hope you guys are as well, too. I hope you guys all are doing as excellent as I am. Um, deep breaths. Deep breaths. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. And I'm going to keep reassuring that to you guys that we're going to get through this. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to get through this. All right? Y'all like the face jewels? I wanted to do something a little glamorous today. Um, everybody deserves some sparkle in their life, so I'm going to do something a little different. All right? So, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome back to the dollhouse because he's been on the show in the beginning of this season, season 18. So, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome back to the dollhouse, Vega Martinez. Hello. Hey, hey. Hey. Yeah, I was worried, no, I, wasn't I, was gonna worried make it. I wasn't gonna make it. No, no. Just introducing, getting the show prepped, and we're glad to have you back. So we did our very first interview at the beginning of the year. January I wanna say January third, twenty twenty four, this year. Oh wow, that was the beginning of this year. That's crazy. Yes. <laughs> and now you're back for your second one. So how has it's it's been a minute since we caught up how has everything been for you so far since our very first interview it's it's shaped out amazing we won uh i think we won over 12 festivals or were selected to 12 festivals um no we won 12 festivals were selected to like 18 and i think we swept like two or three of them so we won almost every award uh and now the movie's been out for a week yeah no Last week was, uh, last Friday was a week, so it's been out for a week. This is the second weekend, um, and things are looking really good. We're getting good reviews. People seem to like it, so, you know, I'm here for it. Yes, um, The Burden of Nine Lives. So yeah. tell us a little bit about the project and what people can expect. I know what to expect because I've seen firsthand the trailer and everything, but you, the, for the viewers out there, tell us a little bit about this remarkable masterpiece uh so <laughs> i don't even know where to start it's a uh it's a fantastic action film that me and my team were able to put together um i'm a little biased when i say that of course you know i wrote and directed it uh had a team of incredible producers working with me so very biased when i say that but like i said the reviews have kind of said that we're not wrong to feel that that strongly about the film because it's been doing amazing um ultimately it follows jimmy diaz who uh after going on a attempt to rob a drug dealer get caught up in a situation where his two cousins are killed and he decides to go john wick and try to get revenge for the things that have happened but along the way he faces he confronts these different parts of of uh society and of the community that kind of help him see things a little bit differently um so it's a it's a wild journey it definitely ended up being a little more thriller than we expected to but uh it worked out great so you guys have to go and check it out it is the burden of nine lives and when you sent it to me and uh, i think it was back in february when you sent this to me the trailer and everything for the film yep i was like wow so it's out now you've won an award for it what else can you add to your list because i know you have something else coming out but i'm not going to say what it is i think as of yet I think right now for Burden, the biggest part of it that um that we're really focused on is the idea of like how much can we do, how much success can we get out of it, right? Like, can we get to a space where it is charting on, you know, it is reaching the top ten charts right now? We we managed to break into the top fifty thousand, which is incredible, right? As an indie film with a very small budget, 
um, a very talented, ambitious team. And, you know, we're in the top 50,000 films, which, you know, normally the number 50,000 sounds crazy when you think about the amount of films that there are in the world, right? For us to be ranked in that space at all is, is a blessing and a half for sure. Um, so that's been, you know, that's really the big focus is now, how do we, we're going to, after we, we're going to spend a little bit of time on Amazon prime, um, and then start expanding to some other platforms. So this way more people can, can watch it. Cause that's ultimately what it comes down to. Absolutely. Now we have something planned for some of the cast that's coming on, because when you reached back out to me, I think it was after February, back mm-hmm. sometime in March was when you reached out to me. So we have some things planned you guys. So you have to stay tuned now. With this, the burden of nine life, did you have any idea filming this project that it was going to be a success for you to garner this award for this masterpiece? It's so funny you asked that because it's the weirdest no possible, right? So when we set out to make the movie, uh, we 100% envisioned it being a success, right? Because the whole purpose was we're going to make a really good, simple action movie that just kind of fits in everybody's living room, right? Like it's not it's not chasing like originally we weren't chasing like an oscar or chasing all these awards or anything we just wanted to make a film that people just like watching right you just kind of kick back and you you just enjoy it right um like get rich or die trying is a film that comes to mind right like that was just a really fun film to watch right like regardless of anything else you could think the acting wasn't great you could think the story like it's just a fun movie to watch um so we were going for that and we ended up in a space where it ended up being more, right? So like the the story got deeper as we started connecting with the actors, Ashley, Steve, um, Sky Zoo, Ari, like they all brought so much life to the characters and really brought them off the page in ways that helped to make the film a little bit more deep as far as like the emotional response to it, right? We see now we go from just having a generic action film to We've had people respond to this saying, how did you make a romance movie out of a gangster story? Right? And I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, it just came together so incredibly well um, because the parts that I know we control are making sure our production runs smoothly, yes. making sure we have a good story, right? Because like, although I write the script and I feel like it's a great story, I'm open to feedback from everybody on the team and I'm always taking that in, right? To the point where in the film, there are scenes that we shot that weren't even in the script. These are just conversations that happened on set between actors and crew or crew and crew or actors and actors. And then we sit down and we go, well, that actually sounds pretty good. We should do it. Let's let's do it. Do we have the time? As long as it fits the time and the budget, we make it happen. Now, with this project, we're now in a day and age where the the presidential election happens. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of creators come out and say, now is the time to create. What advice or tips would you give them? Because we're now seeing the burst of independent filmmakers. Of course, you're up under a production company like Warner Brothers, for example, or Pixar, or whatever it may be. But now we're seeing, even in the music industry, but I want to go to the producting to the production, television, or film aspect. What do you think about the rise of these new up-and-coming filmmakers independently? Um, I think that with or without the election, the independent revolution is happening because of the way people change the way they consume films, right? Um, Like I was talking to someone who works in journalism for one of these major platforms, right? And they, we were just having a conversation as friends, not so much business-wise, right? And they're like, oh yeah, I want to check out the movie. Is it streaming anywhere? And I was like, no, it's, it's up for rent right now. And that kind of stalls the conversation around whether you're going to watch it or not, right? Just because we've changed the dynamic of how people consume film, which for indie filmmakers is kind of a good thing because these platforms that are charging subscriptions need to have an endless supply of content to keep you subscribed, right? So as long as we can continue producing really good quality content, these platforms are going to continue taking the content and that's, that's the future of the industry, I think, for real. Um, I think movie theaters are going to become reserved for major event stuff, yes. right? So we'll still see, like, the studios. Um, we'll start seeing more concert events. Um, actually, the first time I saw anything like the uh, Taylor Swift thing that took place was, I want to say, 2017, 2016. Um, Sony had did, they do, they do, like, an annual PlayStation conference. Um, and that year was the first year that they did it in a way where 
people could go to the movie theaters and sit in the theater and watch the live stream of the event, right? So you get the full production quality sound and this full experience. So I think that's going to be the future of movie theaters where they become more like digital concert venues. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see. And then we'll see like big name movies end up in theater just because of the way like financially, business wise, it's just going a different direction. Now, how do you feel about AI in the film industry? Because it's, it's been a minute since we've talked. And I think it was just on the upcoming scene, we were starting to see it being introduced. But how do you feel about it? And how do you think it would impact the film industry in the future? It's funny you ask because I am scared about AI, um, but not so much, not so much in the, in the film creativity process, but more in the work process, right? Because the reality of it is AI, the, the hardest pill for people to accept is that AI isn't helping anybody with creativity, right? Like it's not making people, it's not making anybody more creative. It's not, you could use AI to write a million scripts. They're all going to be bad because AI doesn't understand language to that extent, right? So as you read through it, it's just going to keep breaking continuity wise because AI can't maintain that level of thought because it's not actually thinking, it's just processing, right? Um, but where AI does become problematic is in the parts of creativity and art that are actually science and just misclassified, right? So like when you think of, like for me specifically, um, my, there's parts of my job that are at risk, right? Because as a sound person, 90% of the work you do as a sound person is science-based, right? And then that last 10% is creativity where you get to kind of play around with sound based on how much you understand about the science. But to EQ, to EQ somebody's voice, is always gonna be the same process. You can throw that in AI, right? To do a 5.1 mix for a surround sound, most of that is a science process. It can be thrown in AI for the majority of it. And then the creative part is like, you as a person, how do you want these things to take up the 5.1 space, right? Um, but just the general part of mixing, getting a balanced mix. And we have actual scientific standards that we use for sound because there are people who can't hear, right? Or we like we have to account for the hard of hearing, we have to account for all these things where the visual part of film doesn't really have to worry about that as much, right? Like you're not worried about colorblind people when you make a movie, you just make the movie, you know? Um, but when you do the sound part, you have to think about like the sound, like there's certain uh, audio levels that we have to meet, um, love standards and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, so from a science level, AI is scary because it's going to, you don't, anything that can be automated as a process can be removed. And we're already seeing it in all of these platforms, right? You look at Premiere, you look at DaVinci, they've all implemented some sort of AI voice enhancement or voice cleanup or noise removal. And it's science. They can do that. Now, the scary part is how we're talking right now. The, how our voices sound, someone can actually use that and duplicate our voices Correct. and put it on something. And we've seen people do it before when it became a thing <laughs> where we, even artists who are no longer living, like I give you an example, Prince, mm -hmm. like people have used some of his vocals and created music for on using other artists' songs. So how he sings, how Prince would sing, they can easily go and take, because he had a very distinct sound mm -hmm. when he would sing, or his voice. You know, you would know his voice. So another one is Michael Jackson. So anybody would instantly know his voice. Anybody would easily take his vocals, and they can go and duplicate it. So that's right. the scary part. And I think it was actress Janet Hubert that said, OK, I do not give AI the right to do and then a lot of actors even when the writer strike was going and they're just like wait what is this we didn't mm -hmm. sign up for this so they're just like it's going to replace me no I didn't sign up for this so now a lot of actors are coming out and pushing back and saying we're not going to go for this yep and, I, and as they should because ultimately you know like I said on the science side of things um there's a lot of ways you can use that right like one of the, you mentioned to to past artists but you know, at the risk of my Drake loving fans coming for me, right? Like he used AI to replicate Snoop Dogg's voice and Snoop Dogg's still alive. You know what I'm saying? So like, how far can this really go? And at what point do we have questions? Because the issue with it is right now we're in the scared phase, right? But once it becomes like the, 
nervous but normal phase, then we just stop acknowledging that things might be AI, right? Or we start over questioning what's AI. So then it becomes that type of catastrophe. Mess. So I don't know, I think it's, uh, it's a scary thought. It's an interesting thought. And we kind of just got to see where it goes because the, the can's already been opened, right? So like, there's no stopping it now, right? All, all we have is the option of we figure out how to make this work the right way, or we end up in a revolution. Those are the only two choices. We've already, the, the line has already been drawn. You know what I'm saying? Um, so hopefully we can figure out how to make it work in a cool way. Cause otherwise we're having a revolution against robots and I don't like our odds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen the thing where they're posting it, where people are like, okay, there's a robot out here that can now bear the children, that can do all of these different things. Like, they're becoming more and more creative right. with technology. So what are you predicting as far as the film industry goes for the next few years? You know, we've got AI, but what else are you predicting next for the film industry in the future of it? So, um, so like, similar to what I was saying earlier, I think, I think right now, there's a a massive overreaction to AI in art, right? Because it's it's like at the beginning, you're gonna have a million people who are not good at art, but they've always wanted to be, use AI to make art, right? Like that's gonna happen. But that number is gonna slowly dwindle down because eventually people are gonna realize like they can't create exactly what they want to create using AI because it's not a symbiotic relationship, right? So that number is just gonna continue falling until it gets to a point where, who knows, maybe the, the most realistic thing that I see happening is we create another category of art for just AI art, right? The same way we should do for trans for sports, right? Because there's just too much complexity in trying to commingle these things. And there is enough of a population to say, if there wants to be a population here that plays these sports, we should support that idea as opposed to arguing about these ideas and where they do or don't fit. You know what I'm saying? Um, so like, that's what I most likely think is gonna happen with AI. I think after a while, it's gonna die down and be way less of a concern in the art space. But I'm ter terrified of what it's gonna do to all of the other spaces. Like, what's it gonna do to finance, right? When you don't need, when we get, we're already at a space where it's damn near impossible to talk to a customer service human. Right, like every company you call customer service, you're spending 20 minutes with a robot before you can talk to a person, right? Like that's gonna happen at the bank. You're gonna go to the bank and when you go to the ATM, it's gonna be an AI teller. You're gonna have a conversation with a robot on the screen and now there's less bankers. And now that's an issue because what happens if something goes wrong? <laughs> exactly. You're gonna spend 40 minutes on the phone talking to another robot just to talk to a person. You know, and they'll play music. I, I know exactly what he's talking about, but this is reality. This it's is reality, reality, and it happens every reality. day. We use technology now. As far as a vacuum goes, we've seen them even do the vacuums that vacuums your house. You don't even have to hold it; it just goes around. It's like yeah. a little robot thing, yeah. like so the, the Roombas, now, right? That's what they're called, Roombas or something. Like the little, like bro, what? You got that thing moving around in your house when you're not home? Like that sounds like a nightmare to me. I'm, like I have a dog and I'd be nervous as shit when he's around the house with, and, I, and I can't see him on the camera, you know, so. That's another thing. You say camera, doorbells are not what they used to be, ladies and gentlemen. And I say that because now we have ring cams. Mm -hmm. So even when you're away from the house, you can actually look on your phone and you can see who's at your house, who's dropping packages off or whatever. You can see it right there. So the ring cam, while you're in your home or even when you're away, you can see it on your phone. So doorbells are not what they used to be. The technology is definitely shifted and improved. And I'm going to say for the better and then some for the worse. Now Liz asked the question. She says, do we know who started AI? And what were the first signs of AI? Um, I wouldn't say that we know. I mean, I'm sure there's some specific like history context book that says very clearly, like gives credit to a person. Um, but the reality of AI and like AI, um, VR, AR, all of these, they're just sub segments of what your computer can do. Right. So like you're, whenever you credit the first real computer, that would be the start of AI. Right. Because the moment that you were able to start doing it, like a calculator is AI. 
right? Like mm-hmm. the, think of how, what you press on a calculator versus what you would have to do on paper to get the same exact answer, right? Like that is artificial intelligence to a degree. So where that's why for me, the conversation of like, AI is so new and it's turning, it's like, no, AI has been around forever. We've just reached an extreme use case now, right? Because automation systems for factories are AI. Right, like that's a version of artificial intelligence. It's just so the complexity that we're talking about here is like with the new artificial intelligence that they're focusing on, it's the ability for it to process and re- respond based on what you're saying, as opposed to just taking instruction. You can now have a, a back and forth dialogue with the device. Um, so that makes it more interesting. But I don't know what the first exact signs would have been. Um, but we could definitely point at the Jetsons in like the seventies. They had oh, a yeah. lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so mean, it's it not be, that gone, you know. <laughs> it would be fly to have a closet. I mean, clueless. What, right. what did you see Cher do in the movie? Um, she had a closet where she she didn't even have to open up the closet. All she had to do was press a button and put her outfit and together. They were um, just like bing, 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 bing. the same way, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, I mean, the closet was revolving. The clothes just came on a hanger, pushed towards you, whatever. I mean, the Jetsons were ahead of their time. Even when the time, you know, the 2000 era, where it was like cyber, intergalactic, more so, we start to see the shift, the beginning of the new age of technology, the internet, and so many things. Mm -hmm. And now we have it where we have our televisions, we can connect them to our phones. All we got to do is scan a code and it'll pop up. So it is definitely improved for the best for all of us. And it just goes back to what Vega just said, which is even when you go in the stores, the calculators, your your cash registers, when we go to self-checkout, that will be a great example. Yep. It's right up there for yep. you, totaling everything up versus having the person, you know, ring things up manually exactly. and totaling exactly. it up from the cash register. So yeah. We don't we don't hear the click 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 anymore mm-hmm. at the register. <laughs> so uh, well, but from I think time that's, to time. From, from time, time to time they do time, right from time to time, time, you know, yeah. especially especially if you're in like the, the very populated urban areas, you know what I mean, then uh then you see a lot more of it. So now I did go to a beauty supply store and there was in the beauty supply store the guy didn't have a credit card machine. Is it was like one of those old fashioned cash registers where he literally had to total everything up. It's like, do, 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 do. So he had to press a number every time. And they was like, we asked, do you take credit card? And he was like, no. So you had to use cash. We had to use cash. So he had an old fashioned credit, um, cash register. That's the That's magic I mean. of technology right there. I'll tell you what. <laughs> and he was just adding things up right there with his calculator very accurate and it showed us the total so we just went ahead and paid my cash but we've come a long way from that we don't have to do that anymore whereas you have it where you can go in the store and get what you want and ring it up yourself and you see it right there on the screen presented to you so you come a long way mm-hmm. and like you said with the with the movie side of things too it's like the technology aspect of it that's what makes it possible for people like me to make films it, there's a lot of technology advancement that we've had over the last decade over the last two decades that make filmmaking so much more accessible um and that's part of like my big motivation with with the films that i make is being able to go to other people and be like look i did this you know what i'm saying like i i appreciate that i can recognize the talents i have but i don't see myself as significantly special compared to other people right so if i can do it you can do it too like we can all do this it's just a degree of like how by what measure do you want to do it, right? Like my measure, I think we talked about this on the last episode, my measure of success is just being able to pay my bills, right? So if somebody's working at Burger King right now and they can pay their bills and I'm making movies for a living and I can pay my bills, I think I'm good here. You know what I mean? I think there's really not much to to really discuss, you know? Um, Would I love to be on a stage making multi-million dollar films? Of course, right? As long as it makes sense, because I also think some films are, severely over budgeted and that's a different conversation but um as long as it makes sense like i don't ever want to waste tons of money on something that i don't think needs to spend that much money right i think that's part of the most fun part of the creative process for me is figuring out how do we make this happen with the money we have available to us and 
Now, to make it look and make it look Hollywood quality right. though, because we're not we're not right. doing no janky shit. <laughs> but and your stuff does, and that's another thing. Um, for filmmakers, create. What tips of advice would you give them about creating? Because I've seen you. I think you were on a podcast, and you were talking about creating a budget. Mm -hmm. What advice to filmmakers would you give to them for creating a budget? And you got to have your team there as well for you too. So it's a lot that goes into it. And I think of Jurassic Park, which is one of the highest grossing films in history. Yep. And it took a lot of production, a lot of money, a lot of time to do something like that. So what are some tips and advice that you would give to filmmakers on budgeting and creating yourself a budget for filmmaking? Ooh. Ooh. You know, I didn't even realize I was prepared for this question, but I'm prepared for this question. Here we go. <laughs> so I got three specific tips that I think are really important for any filmmaker that's at or around the level that I'm at, right? Like if you're working in a, in a low budget space under $500,000, you're working with, you know, C to B list cast respectfully, right? Like there's just the way they classify people. I don't believe in that stuff entirely, but it's a business at the end of the day, there's certain things you got to work with. Um, so like, if you're in these spaces, right, a couple of things that I think are super important. First things first, make sure you're working with a script that you can actually budget, right? Like I, there's too many times where like someone will send me a script um, and they want some help budgeting it or producing it and I'll read through it and I'm like, yo, I get your ambition here, right? But you don't have the money for a motorcycle to go through a window and end up on a street for a car scene, for a car chase scene. Like, there's just, you don't have that. I know you don't have that because you already told me what your budget is, right? Like, so this isn't a conversation about me guessing or trying to put it down. It's just being realistic, right? Like, so in the, which kind of goes into the second point, right? Make sure that your film is telling the story you needed to tell. Because at, at the indie level, at the low budget level, people are attaching to stories, right? That's why you see so many Hollywood movies get what get reviews of like two three four five they get terrible views even though millions of people are watching it it's because millions of people are watching hollywood movies because they're attaching to the actors in some capacity they're attacking to the producer in some capacity the director right indie movies you don't have that so you have to deliver a story right and when i say deliver a story it's not just about the writing it's what are people on the what are you people watching on the screen happen right like i said i felt like we made a dope action crime thriller right when other people watch it and they get back to me they're like yo how did you make a romantic action film and i'm like i have to watch this movie again because i didn't realize we did that right that's what you want from people you want them to be so engaged with the story of it that they're understanding things that you might not even seen right they're capturing moments that you might not have seen they're quoting things that happen right um which then the last part of it is the tougher part because it's a, a harder conversation but it's still around budget concepting right it's like make sure that you're booking actors with your end goal in mind right so if your end goal is simply to win awards spend your money on the best performances you possibly can it doesn't matter if they have one million followers or if they never started a social media account at all right you just want the best performance possible if you want to have a movie that's just going to bring in some revenue, it might not be that great. Get a bunch of social media influencers, right? Like just depends on what, what fits your budget. For me personally, I think, and this is the advice, this is the actual advice piece, right? Is find a balance, right? Find a balance where you have incredible actors like Steve, right? Like Louis Barrio, like Ashley, like Alicia Wright, right? And then you pair them with influencers that can also be great, that you genuinely see the potential in, not because they just have tons of followers, right? Like when we booked Rico, we genuinely said, yo, Rico looks like he could be an incredible actor and he just hasn't been given that chance. So we get an amazing following and we get a really talented guy, right? Oh, Boom, yes. we put him, put him in the movie, he wins his first supporting actor role, right? So we have to take those chances, take those risks, but also be very calculated about it. Um, and then the last piece, with your budget, when you're approaching people, crew or cast, tell them what you can afford to pay them. Don't ask them what their rate is. Because if you ask what their rate is, you're just gonna end up in a frustrating conversation where you realize you can't actually afford it, right? But if you approach them with what you have available, you might catch them in a moment where they're, the, it's the perfect trifecta lines up. They're interested in your story. They're open-minded to taking the, the project at a discount. 
right? <clears throat> or they're in a position where they just finished the project that paid them well enough that they can just take something on a discount, right? Ultimately, going to them and telling them with the open, honest transparency, it shows you are serious about your project, you're serious about your budget, and you can be trusted, right? Because you're opening the conversation right out the gate, telling me the most honest information I need to know. So now it's up to me if I want to be on the project or not. You know what I mean? And that's the situation you want people to be in. Because once you can do that, then I think uh, it's, it's a lot easier to make a low budget project. Um, that's just from the, from the financial side, right? Like there's a lot more that goes into it, right? There's finding funding, whether it be through product placement, through investors, through crowdfunding. There's a ton of stuff into it. But those are just a couple of things that I think really help me and my team when we put together what we do. And not only just that, but you said influencers. So the influencers will benefit from it as well, too. Mm -hmm. The actors that you've casted will also benefit from it as well, too. And it was a young lady who did a TikTok today. She's um, talking about the election or whatever. And she said, if you want to help, go ahead and pour back into the independent black filmmakers and filmmakers of color. Pour into True. them as well to donate to them. If you see them working on a project, help them out. Ask them, okay, what are you willing to do? Negotiate. Now is the time for anybody who is creative to negotiate and put that creativity to use. And now I'm starting to see more and more projects coming out. Mm -hmm. People are saying they're looking for casting for actors. Take If you're an actor, now would be the best time to take those opportunities. Go ahead and film that project. Get in that project. Audition for that project. Yep. And get those roles. Built. It's a lot of opportunity out here. So back to supporting and funding filmmakers, independent filmmakers, because it's not easy for anybody independent, even with me. I'm not under a network or a label. I do this because this is what I love to do. This is the leisure of me. This is what I invest in. So the fashions, the hair, the makeup, the everything, all of that is out of my pocket. Yep. I paid for them. So being an independent creator, you're having to sacrifice. You're having to pay out of your pocket. Where is if you're backed under a production company, as I've mentioned, Warner Brothers, Pixar, mm -hmm. or Marvel, whatever it may be, you're having to go by their guidelines. Whereas if you're independent, you have a little bit more leverage and control into what you want your project to look like. The same thing for the music industry. Yep. Um, even with that, if you're signed to a record label, you're going to have to put out that album on a specific date. You're going to just have to go along. I mean, yeah, you'll have some creative input, but you won't have full total control. So right. I use this example all the time. They're one of my favorite girl groups, TLC. For their, I want to say, third album, this is after Left Eye Passed Away, for their third album, um, they really didn't have a say so. They really had to, you know, they were still processing the loss of her. And the record label was like, okay, we need an album out. So 3D was the last album. And I think it was T Boss. T Boss said in an interview with Cam Newton, when she sat down with Cam Newton, she said, for their third album, you saw the album covers, all of them dressed in black. Mm -hmm. That's not what they wanted. The first single that came out was Girl Talk. And they wanted another single that came out. They were signed to Arista Records. Who do we know that owns or is part of Arista Records? We think of Clive Davis, Whitney Houston, yep. because she was signed to that label. And so far, but, but she had somewhat creative control, but they really didn't. So, I mean, there's different aspects to the industry. Whereas if you're doing it independently, you're paying out of your pocket. It's a lot of money, yes, but it's so worth it. So to any independent filmmakers out there, I say, go ahead, take that opportunity now. Take that class, take that course. And to the ones that want to help independent filmmakers out here, go ahead and donate to yep. them. Help them out. Yep, because <clears throat> that value helps a lot. And even if you can't donate, like just watching the movie goes so far, right? Like we're in an industry where, especially film specifically, it's a super upward moving industry, right? Like as long as you are active, as long as you're continuously working on stuff, and as long as you're improving from the last thing you did, it tends to, to be very fruitful and give opportunity, right? So as long as you continue to make projects happen, you get more and more introductions, more and more relationships, more and more opportunities. And um, that's a really big element of it. So like I said, the, the big element of it is just watching the films. That's why it's so important for us as filmmakers, um, when we're putting our films together, to think about like how we're going to get those films distributed. Because with, without knowing that, it's, it's a very, very difficult battle. 
Um, Because once you know where it's going to be distributed, then you can start those conversations around like, hey, support us by watching The Burden of Nine Lives on Amazon Prime. Like right now it's available for rent or purchase. Um, And then as we up and up more platforms where people can watch it, just watch it on those different platforms, wherever it's available and most accessible to you, watch it. it. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've covered the business aspect of it for independent filmmakers and producers and writers out here. What about writers? What advice would you give to them that are willing to write? Write every day, write every day. Right every day. That is the most important piece. I was having a conversation with a film student recently, um, and we were talking about that a bit because she was like, yeah, I've been stuck. I've been trying to write this feature for a while. I was like, the problem is that, that sometimes as creatives, we don't allow structure to be part of our creative process, right? Like structure can also be creative, right? And sometimes structuring yourself, especially for some creatives, is the most important piece, oh, yeah. right? So like if you, if you find yourself, you've been struggling to write a 90-page script for three months, for three years. I know some people have been struggling for their whole life, right? Like break it down, put some structure to it, right? And that's what I told this student. It's like, you put some structure to it, right? It's a 90 page script. You wanna get it done in a month, there's 30 days in a month, right? Three pages a day, you're there. You know what I mean? Like, that's it, that's 90 pages. Can you write three pages a day, right? If you're struggling to write three pages a day, then that means either a, you might not love writing as much as you think you do, or B, you have a lot of other stuff going on in life that's stressing you out and blocking you from being able to be creative. Don't let your art add to that stress. Absolutely. Absolutely. And put that creativity to use. I know even for singers, you get what's called writer's block. And even for writers out here that are mm-hmm. on set of the production companies and for films, you somewhat get that creative block. But you can pull inspiration from anywhere, just the everyday items. I've sat with so many filmmakers, such as yourself, and writers for film and production. And they say, you know what? I get inspiration from just going out, talking to the everyday people. Mm-hmm. Or even from your family can be your best inspiration. But you'll find it somewhere. People watching. That's uh, one of my favorite things to do. I am, I'm that person that is outside completely harmlessly sitting in the park, just watching everybody. Just getting an understanding of like, there's such a, we, when we, when we talk about writing or talk about creating stories, we have this fantasy of how people behave and how people act, right? But when you go out and just watch people, you realize we all act and behave the same way. There's little variables that we have that alternate and those are the important things that we have to highlight. Right, so for me as a writer, um, and, and this is one thing I love when it gets, it, uh, it's been highlighted a few times and it really, it's a, it's a real ego booster for me, um, is when people acknowledge that in my films, every character has value, right? You don't really mm-hmm. see a bunch of random faces that just pop in and out or say something silly or tough guy moment and they're gone. Like everybody has a moment where you see them kind of express a variation of emotions, right? You see happy, you see sinister, you see sad, you see evil, you see confused, right? And that's intentional because that's how people live every day. Even the most worst people that we know, right? They feel the same emotions we do. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's, that's uh, one of the big things that I try to really bring to life in, in the stories I tell. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. So we covered the filmmaking aspect, the directing aspect, and the writing aspect. Do we have any questions for Vega or myself, Fashion Dolls? This conversation is so good, and right now, yeah, I love it's the time. To Liz's put- question. That was fun. That was a good question. <laughs> yeah, for writers. Yeah. Yes, and it's a lot of people that want to write, that want to get into filmmaking, writing, and producing, and co-directing, whatever it may be but they're not sure about how to go at it. So hopefully this could help you guys at home that are looking to get into filmmaking and writing and producing your own content versus being up under a major production company, as I've mentioned with the ones like Warner Brothers or Marvel, whatever it may be. So you have options, you have options, but I'm saying everybody's doing independent right now. That's the best route to go. Mm -hmm. Especially for people like me, I have a hard time having a regular job <laughs> fashion dolls do we have any questions for myself or vega this conversation i hope you guys are enjoying it um the year is just about flown by so fast it so did. 2025 what are you manifesting 
for the future of 2025? Uh, 2025, I want everything that we worked on in 2024 to really just blow up. I don't, um, there's one project that I plan on shooting in 2025. It's called Heartbreakation. It's a comedy. Um, I felt like I wanted to go with something more funny after these last couple films. Um, so we'll be shooting that in uh, Dominican Republic partially. So that'll be a lot of fun. But in the meantime, like, I just want to see every project I've worked on this year really, really succeed. Like, I got the privilege of working on a um, series called Natives that you guys can check out on YouTube right now. The first two episodes are out. Um, and that one is amazing, in my opinion. Like, it's a really fun New York-style story um, that I think a lot of people would love. Uh, that one's really fun. I worked on a horror called Unlit that we shot in uh, Pennsylvania. That was super fun. The, the makeup artist on that team was crazy good. Like, the whole team was amazing, but she just stood out with the makeup that she did. Um, the actresses were great. Uh, what else did I work on this year? Oh, I worked on something recently with uh, Atticus uh, Orsborn, um, a director out of the UK. He came out here, and we shot something a couple weeks ago. Um, what was it called? Till, Till Dawn, I want to say is what it was called. I feel like it was called Till Dawn. Um, that feels right. So we're going to go with that. Yeah, so I just... And then, of course, like the features that we have, right? I want to see Burden end up on more platforms. I want to see Nico end up on more platforms, right? I just want to see all of the stuff we're working on really take up and boom. Um, and then I got Beyond Detention and The Quiet Road are scheduled to come out next year, which is two other features that I directed. So, you know, just trying to make sure everybody gets to see the movies because if nobody sees them, then, you know, that's when we have to battle. Got to get them out there. Promote, promote, promote. And that's something, another thing, advice that I would give to independent filmmakers or creative artists is get out there, promote yourself. Nobody can do it better than you. So that's a fact. take time and do that. Promote Especially yourself. if you can't afford to pay someone to do it better than you, right? So, like, I'm in a space where we can't, we can't necessarily afford a great PR team, right? So Stevie is one of uh, the emails out of like a thousand emails that we sent out that responded and we got an interview locked in, right? Like all of the press that we get comes from that process of sending 100, 200 emails a week just in the hopes that somebody will read it. You know what I mean? Let alone start a conversation, just open it and read it. <laughs> but, you know, on, on the other side of the equation, like you guys have a lot you're dealing with too. Right, you're getting get a hundred emails a day from a hundred different people trying to get a yes. little bit of coverage for their thing. So it's it's a double edged sword that it, it, we got to figure out a balance for. But ultimately, once you find that balance, and that's why I appreciate our relationship so much, because once you find those balances, then it makes life a little bit easier on those fronts, right? Like I know that at the very least, I know for sure I can count on you to open the email. Will I definitely get an interview? Will I definitely get time? Nah, that's that's the part of the conversation. But I know you'll open the email, and that's critical. <laughs> yes. I, I check my email every day, so I read it. You know, so that's all we can really ask for as creatives, and we got to appreciate that. So any creatives out there hearing that part, like, I guess that's another tip. Like, appreciate the people that help you, even if you don't think they helped you enough, right? Like, every bit is is a step out of their way to do something for someone completely outside of themselves. So you got to just... Say thank you and, you know, appreciate what you got. Absolutely. And, and be kind to your neighbor. Help the next person out. Mm -hmm. If you see, Even in acting workshops, because I'm seeing a lot of acting workshops as well, too. Make sure that you're helping your neighbor out. Help them rehearse their lines. If they need a scene partner, ask them to be the scene partner. There's so many ways you could go about as far as acting, as far as directing, as far as writing, as far as producing, as far as hosting a platform. There's so many ways and so many things out here. And even me, I have a mentor. So shout outs to my mentor, Miss Melody, for just being a beacon of light and encouraging me, okay? And then my brother, Scott Valentine, is another one too. So it's great to have mentors and people that I can. Um, K Tooks, who comes in every day. Shout outs to my brother, K Tooks. Always checking in. So it's so many people that you can reach out to and help you if you need to know what direction should you go as far as your platform. So yeah, me, I don't know what's going to happen as far as things goes with this platform, but luckily I'm still able to continue it. And we will, we will. And that's Season it. 19, we're going to keep it in the future. We're going to keep it going. Season so, 19, we open it strong, baby. <laughs> yes. I'm, I've already started planning. As far as fashion, as far as looks, as far as different things, 
goes, I don't know. You guys just have to stay tuned. I'm always coming up with something different. I'm always reinventing myself. So you guys just have to stay tuned for that. But we've already started and we've already got guests that are coming on for season 19, which will be in 2025 in the new year. So it's going to be a pretty good good lineup, fresh new faces, and I'm pretty sure you guys will enjoy it. So I'm excited for that. But before we close, Vega, what are some other gems that you would like to leave with the fashion dolls as far as creating, as far as vision, and with this year coming by so fast? It seemed like 2024 came and went. We started off, we did our interview in the beginning of the year, January Mm -hmm. 3rd. So the beginning of the season, and now we're close to the end of 2024. So what are yeah. some gems that you would lead to the fashion dolls as far as going into the new year? I think this one goes a little bit outside of creativity and more to just humanhood, right? Like right now we're in a crazy times, right? Everybody's panicking over the election and not sure what life is going to look like. And I think the biggest piece of a gem that I'm hoping I can drop right now is just take a breath. Like, just take a breath. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many things right now that are ridiculously overwhelming that every now and then you just got to take a breath, realign yourself, figure out what's going on, figure out how you feel, where you stand, and then understand, like, we can't, can't turn anything backwards, right? So we have to figure out how to navigate forward. And that's it. Absolutely. And Vega must have been peeking over here at my notes because that ties into (laughs) today's final thought. That ties into today's final thought, which is taking a breath and protecting your peace. Today's final thought is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he says, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. You are in charge of your peace. You are in charge of your destiny. And you are in charge of navigating your future and what you want your life to look like in the next four years. Because all of our lives are going to change forever. But we just have to navigate through it. Find your joy. Find your compass piece. I've been panicking and losing it. And big, I mean, we've talked behind the scenes as well as others. And they know that I've been going crazy with this whole election. Everybody's still processing mm-hmm. it. But take the time you need. Take that time. Heal. Recover. Come back. Fortify. Mobilize. Organize. Come back stronger. And that's why I say now is the time to create more than ever. And I think it was Kim Coles from Living Single or somebody that posted something about taking the time to create now. If you got a business to start up, go ahead and start that business up now. Go yep. ahead now at the time. Do not wait. I do vision boards. So it's like almost everything that I put on my vision board has now come to fruition. And I must say, it's been a, a great, successful year because when we did our first interview, it was the beginning of the season. I was like, okay, how are people going to react to everything? The new drop, backdrop, the new everything. I was just worrying, worrying, worrying. I was like, people are going 